Good day, everyone. Welcome back to my channel. My name is Amidat Ayofu Fashola. I am super excited to be here to be sharing the word of the Lord with you. And I hope you guys are doing amazing. It is another Wednesday. If you're hearing anything in the background, it is my fan making a lot of noise. But it is really hot in here in Montreal. And so we're just going to manage. So today we're going to be doing Amos chapter 5. And I'm super excited, you know, to hear the word of the Lord today. And um, how did your day go? I hope your day went well. Mine actually did. And uh, I just finished working out and I'm pretty, pretty fresh right now. And um, yeah, super excited, you know, to be sharing the water. Though, not going to lie, I'm actually quite tired. And I just want to like take a nap or something <laughs> before prayer time. But mm, we're going to get to it. There's a lot of work that needs to be done in the kingdom and we can't slack. All right. So we're going to basically just start. Um, I feel like today's Bible study is actually packed, but I'm trying to like make it as like short and, you know, cute and like straight to the point. Um, okay. So Amos chapter five, King James version as usual. So one second here. Yeah. So we're going to pray before we actually begin anything. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for bringing us here today to glean from your word. Thank you, Father, for everything that you've prepared for us today, O Lord. Abba, be thou exalted, Lord, in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father, for your power, for your presence, for your grace. Thank you, Father, for your faithfulness, O Lord. We exalt your holy name, O Lord, in Jesus' name. And I pray that as we've come here to glean from your word, I pray that you will Open our hearts to receive your word. And I pray that you will heal us through the listening of your word today, O oh Lord, in Jesus' name. For let your word heal our souls, our minds, our bodies. Let your word purge us, O oh God, in Jesus' name. And that we glorify your name, O oh God. And as I teach today, I allow you to teach through me. I block every distraction from my end and from the audience's end. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. All right, so we know the power of the word of the Lord, and I think it's, I'm super proud of you, right, that you're here to glean from the word, to hear the word of the Lord. There are so many things that you could be doing with your time right now, but you are here to listen to the word of the Lord. We're not talking about, you know, anything secular. We're talking about the word of the Lord. So kudos to you. So we're going to just start. Amos chapter five, King James Version. Hear those, hear ye this word which I take up against you. Um, again, if you're like confused about like how did you get to Amos chapter five, um, we've been talking about Amos. We've done Amos chapter one, we've done Amos chapter two, three, four, and now one five. We've been talking about how the Lord is going to basically judge the people. The Lord is talking to through Amos, you know, about what's been going on in like Israel, right? And their evil act. And it feels like it's the same thing over and over again, but it's like touching like different topics right if you look really deep into it um so we're just gonna start um that wasn't you know much of a summary but that's all I can say right now um if you want to know more you can just kind of like you know briefly go through the past um teachings so uh, hear ye hear ye this word which I take against take up against you even a lamentation all ye Israel or ye house of Israel the virgin of Israel is fallen. She shall no more rise. She is forsaken upon her land and there is none to raise her help. But thus said the Lord God, the city that went out by a thousand shall leave a hundred and that which was went forth by a hundred shall leave 10 to the house of Israel. I remember when I was reading Ezra chapter two today, there was the spirit of the Lord just asked me to, you know, basically I like Ezra chapter two, verse 64 to 67. I didn't really know why I was doing that, but I basically just, you know, took a screenshot and I didn't know it was actually, you know, related to the Bible study today. And so before we even start doing Ezra chapter two, verse 64 to 67, we're going to actually go into second Chronicles chapter 36, verse 23. And if you look into Amos chapter five, verse two, I mean, it talks about how, you know, Israel is fallen. And if you are thinking like, okay, how can a city be fallen? Um, a city can be fallen when they've gone through like, you know, oppression or war. Um, you see that Israel was fallen more than 
she she was fallen um and then sort of never recovered you know um so she fell right um and we're gonna see exactly when she fell um and it says like you know the city that left right the city left by a thousand and it's the city went out a thousand and shall leave a hundred and that which went forth by a hundred shall leave ten to the house of Israel. So I'm going to read that verse again to anyone that's interested. It says, for thus said the Lord God, the city that went out by a thousand shall leave uh, a hundred. So it went out a thousand, shall went out a thousand, shall leave, you know, shall leave a hundred. Um, at that which went forth a hundred shall leave. 10 to the house of Israel. And so we're going to kind of look up into the scripture about like, you know, what does that exactly mean? Are there any scripture references to kind of like, you know, um, confirm that word? And so we're going to have to look into um, Second Chronicles chapter 36, verse 23 first. It says, thus said Cyrus. No, actually, let's do, hmm, let's do Second Kings. Second Kings chapter 25 um, if you don't know, um, the ending of Second Kings is basically how the king of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, actually went up against Jerusalem, according to the prophecy of the Lord that, you know, is going to, um, again, is going to basically make Jerusalem fall and like it's never going to come up again. And basically the Lord was going to actually take Jerus uh, Jerusalem, which is Judah. Um, and Israel out of his sight completely. So that means that he wants no, he wants nothing to do with them again. And so they would have to go through seasons and seasons of oppression um, by this um, even kings. And so one of them is Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, that comes into Jerusalem and pitched against it. And war, he, he basically he is warring against, you know, Jerusalem. And we find in chapter um, verse four to five, it says like the city was broken up, right? And all the men of war fled by night. Um, before you would see how, like if you're reading like um second Kings chapter, um, well, second Kings and you're reading towards the end, 23, 24, 25, you see how Nebuchadnezzar actually manages to actually break down Judah like pieces by pieces. It didn't just stop one time. Like he actually like, started with like by taking the king the edge right um and then just started to eat into the city and he, he, he basically fought the city to the point where like it took the men the women the children all of them um no not all of them but he left the poor in the city those ones that basically that could not fight the vulnerable he left them in the city and he took those ones into the um, into Babylon to basically join Babylon and kind of like join their economy there and you know just the way um children of Israel were working in Egypt back in those days right um and then he basically was like you know what I'm gonna besiege this city right um and then he goes on to doing that right um the city was broken up all the men of war fled you know, by night, by the way of the gate between two walls, which is by the king's garden. And at this point, um, Jerusalem still had a king, right? Um, even though like there was um king of Babylon was warring against it. So um it was this king, um Zedekiah, that was um in tune. But if you read it in detail, because I don't have my notes like written, like I didn't plan to actually say this story. Well, anyways. Um, but there was a defense, it was sort of like a defense, it was still kind of like defending, there was a king that was actually defending his throne, he was kind of defending Jerusalem for a minute there, but it didn't last long, because um, they basically dealt with him, and he was basically like eradicated, and we see that Babylon, the king of Babylon actually ends up um, overcoming Jerusalem, um, and he says, you know, this mighty men of war basically they leave the city now the city does not have any defense now the child is where against the city roundabout and the king went the way towards the plain and the army of the child is pursued after the king and overtook him into in, in the plains of jericho and all his army were scattered from him and and they took the king and brought him 
up to the king of Babylon in Ribla and they gave judgment unto him. So if you're following the story, um, you would see that basically, like that's basically what I'm saying. Um, Many of the kings that tried to, well, there was even a, a king that was, um, sort of the 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 throned by um, so I think he's the king of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon as well. Um, it was basically given to a band, um, and then he wasn't able to become the king. He was supposed to be the king. Um, you know the politics basically started happening by this foreign kings entering into the politics of you know Jerusalem and Judah determining how like you know their their politics would be like would be the leaders and then they went up to actually like you know totally just overtaking and, and ruling everything and taking over um and so that's what we see but that is basically like the prophecy that you know they will if you go back to Amos, um, it's not something that the Lord hasn't done before. It says the city, um, it said the, the virgin of Israel is fallen, like she will no longer rise. So these are the oppressors, like they're coming into the city to basically oppress the city. Okay, so we're going to do um, Second Kings chapter 25 to um, 9, verse 9, right? We're not doing everything. And it says, um, this Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, actually, right? He burned the house of the Lord, um, which is what the Lord said. If you go into the previous chapter, he said that he's going, that he's going to remove them out from his presence. So anything that is symbolic of like, you know, God being present amongst them will be basically eradicated because we know that the Lord actually deals with symbolism, you know, symbolism in the earth. I'm um, just like the way he told Abraham to build an altar um, when he was going to make a promise to him or when he had made a promise to him, signifying his presence with them. And so the temple we talked about, it is, a, is an altar. It's part of the altar, right? And so the, Nebuchadnezzar now is, burning the house of the Lord and the king's house and all the houses of Jerusalem and every great man's house burnt he with fire. So this is like, he's getting rid of like, you know, the land is getting like, well, not the land, but like the components of it, getting rid of like, you know, Jerusalem, the mighty, should I say the mightiness of Jerusalem and all the people, all the army of childers, um, they broke down the walls of, you know, the Jerusalem roundabouts. And if you know anything about Jerusalem, Jerusalem is like considered to be like a holy city. Um, it was basically consecrated like to the Lord. Um, the temple was in Jerusalem. Um, and so we can now go into chapter 21 and it says and the king of babylon smote them and slew them at ribla in the land of amath so judah was carried away out of their land okay um so yeah like the king of babylon nebuchadnezzar actually dealt with them um yep so um, So all of the so you're saying with them, um, then are the men of war, five men of them that were in the king's uh, presence that was found in the city, the principal scribe of the host. Those men were the ones that Nebuchadnezzar actually killed. So he's wanting to, and, and I've heard you know someone actually say this in the secular realm and um, on the physical modern realm, this realm right now, um, that you know basically if a an opposition wants to break down a community or certain people or race you will start with the leaders first first destroy the leaders and then you can go ahead to eating into the community or into the population so yeah that's basically what happened there um so we're going to do like second corinthians and i always say corinthians so chronicles second chronicles chapter 36 verse 23 it says, thus said Cyrus, king of Persia. Um, before we even get into this part, let's just go into the book of Amos again, and then we're just going to adjust the polls back and forth. Um, so this is what the Lord has said. Um, For thus said the Lord God, the city, the city that went out of Jerusalem and shall leave a hundred. So yeah, like this is what's going to happen. Um, okay, let's go back to that. Um, 
Second Chronicles, it says, thus said Cyrus, king of Persia, all the kingdoms of the earth as the Lord God of heaven given me, and he hath charged me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is there among you of all his people? The Lord is God. Um, the Lord is God, be with him and he let him go up. So um, if you go into let if you go back into the book of um Second Kings chapter 25, you see basically what happened and you're asking now, how is it that the children of Israel were kind of transitioned from the king of Babylon into, um, you know, the king of Persia, Cyrus. Um, so if you look in, you would see that um, it came to pass in the seventh and thirtieth year of the captivity of um, Jehoiachin, king of Judah, in the twelfth month of, on the twelfth and twentieth day of the month, that evil Meredosh, king of Babylon in the year that he began to reign did lift up the head of Joachim king of Judah out of prison um okay so this is mm, this is not where we're going oh it's chronicles it's first chronicles my bad my bad okay so it's going to be first chronicles And if we don't get there, that part, um, okay. Anyways, it's gonna be the last chapter of Second Chronicles. I don't have my I have my Bible here, but it's gonna be yeah. I don't want to waste enough time. But basically, um, uh, what happened is, um, the king of Babylon actually hold on one second here let's look for it yep um so it says here second chronicle chapter 36 right um Basically, um, the reign of the king of Babylon was over and Persia, the king of Persia, basically, which is um, Cyrus, basically started to reign over the people of Israel. And I just wanted to like show the biblical reference, actually. Um, I think it would have been nice to show the biblical reference. Um, if you read Ezra chapter one, okay. Um, Ezra chapter one talks about how now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, and the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah. Um, okay. Yeah, I'm gonna try to put the um scripture down below, right? Um, but yeah, I'm gonna try to do it. Um, but basically, the following the king that basically overcame and then took over was Persia, um, Cyrus, king of Persia, and so yeah, um, so if we keep going. From Second Chronicles, chapter thirty-six, right? Um, it says, "Thus said Cyrus, king of Persia, all of the kingdoms of the earth have the Lord given me, and he charged, and he has charged me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is there among you of all this of all his people? The Lord is God. Be with him and let him go up." Okay, so the Holy Spirit actually actually reminded me. I don't know if you remember the movie, um, Daniel. I don't know if you watched it. You would see that there was a prophecy. Even I don't. I think it was Jeremiah that actually said the. Pro yeah, it was a Jeremiah or Daniel. It was Daniel. It was Daniel that said the prophecy against the king of um kingdom Cadnesa, and I told him that the king of Persia was going to reign over Babylon, basically take over. Okay, um, I don't know if you remember. 
um, it was it wasn't Nebuchadnezzar. It was Nebuchadnezzar's son that rebelled against the Lord by using the um, ornament in the house of the Lord for um, drink for drinking wine and stuff. And then the Lord was actually very upset, and then prophesied against um, him through King Nebuchadnezzar. But the story you will not find in like the early parts of like the Bible, like Second Chronicles, because um, I'm trying to give you like biblical references. I'll try to put it in the description bar um but basically like that's what happened and that's why um that's how king of persia actually came into the picture um and then it said it yeah charged him to actually build the house in jerusalem um and i think it's pretty interesting because like you see that cyrus the king of persia is not even a is not about the lord um, the Lord just charged him to actually begin a project, but you'd see that you will, you'll find even Cyrus, the king of Persia, actually betraying the Lord in the process. And um, it says, who is there among you to actually do the job? And so we're going to go into um, Ezra, um, which is pretty interesting. Ezra chapter 2, verse 64 to 65. I'm um, 67, sorry. Oh. Got the eyes in here. Okay, so and it says so we can kind of see the transition of this people. Although, like, I actually wanted to go into Exodus. Um, before actually doing this part, let's do let's go into Exodus. So I'm trying to give you an idea of just how like oppressed these people are, uh, where, um, just how scattered they were. Um, you know, we've talked about. The, the king of Babylon, right? We've talked about the king of Babylon, his role to play um, in basically taking over by, um, Jerusalem, killing their men, killing their women. And when we're going to Exodus now, um, chapter five, right? We're going to see like even how difficult times were for the children of Israel. Um, so... Again, going back to Amos chapter five, it says, you know, Israel was actually fallen, right? Um, Israel's fallen. The city as this is what's basically happening. Like they're actually going through it. And I'm I'm trying to show you guys like how they're going through it. Um, so this is like taking you way back into the history, like the one that we just kind of glossed over during the time of like um, King of Nebuchadnezzar, um, even glossing a little bit into like King of Persia's reign as well, but we've not gotten into that yet, just touching surface. Um, in the reign of Pharaoh, okay, over the children of Israel. If you read the word here, you would see how Moses and Aaron um, were given the mandate by God to actually go to Pharaoh to tell the people to let let his people go. Okay. In fact, what the Lord, what Moses and Aaron told Pharaoh was that he said, The Lord of the the God of Hebrews of Hebrews hath met with us. Let us go, we pray thee, three days' journey in the desert and sacrifice unto the Lord our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with the sword. So they didn't basically ask Pharaoh that, oh, Pharaoh, like, let us, like, um, let us go, like, permanently. And, like, you know, they only asked Pharaoh that, oh, we just want to take three days break. We want to um, take three days off. Okay, that was basically what they asked um, of Pharaoh. But Pharaoh, what did Pharaoh say? What did he say? He said, wherefore do ye, Moses and Aaron, let the people from thy works get you onto your burdens like deal with the stuff yourself and leave those people to work is what he's trying to say you know and it, it goes back and back back and um, you know back and back and it says pharaoh said behold the people of the land now are many and ye make them rest from their burdens right you're trying to make them rest is what you're saying so no rest day is what he's trying to say he said pharaoh commanded the same day the tax masters of the people and their officers saying ye shall no more give the people straw to make bricks as here the two for let them go and gather straw themselves so the straw was supposed to make their works easier faster um and it says on the towel of the bricks which they did make here too for ye shall lay upon them ye shall not diminish of their for thereof but they be idle therefore 
they cry, saying, let us go and sacrifice to our God. And so basically it's like, you know, don't give them straw. And you have to make sure that whatever they were making before, the number of bricks that they're making before, they have to still make it, even though they have to go and find the straw and then make it, you know. And it says, let their let their more work be laid upon the men that they may labor therein and let them not regard vain words, okay? Um, and so the tax masters basically goes in there and their officers, um, they, they told the people what Syria told them and people, you can see how the people, the poor were scattered abroad throughout all the land of Egypt to gather stubble instead of straw, right? Um, and they were just running to figure out what to do. Imagine like, and it said that tax masters hastened them saying, fulfill your work to daily tax as when there was straw. So he knew exactly like, you know, this is not going to exactly work, but he was still pushing them and pushing them to do, to produce the same fruit that they did before, knowing the fact that, you know, it wasn't going to happen. Like it, it was like, it's unrealistic what Pharaoh is actually asking of them. Um, and it says something actually then happened, right? And it says, the officers of the children of Israel, which Pharaoh, Pharaoh's tax masters had set over them. So these men were actually like children of Israel as well. They were Israelites. And um, these people that they were like, because sort of like, you know, supervisors, the supervisors were beaten and they were demanded, whereof have ye not fulfilled your tax? But they couldn't. What Pharaoh was asking was very unrealistic. And so they, were, they weren't able to actually fulfill the tax in making breaks both yesterday and today as here for two, uh, year two, four, right? And they were beating their supervisors and the supervisors actually came and cried on to Pharaoh saying like, you know, because the tax masters were the one beating them, right? Um, um, okay, so he says, you know, da. It says they were beaten and demanded, right? Well, it's not very playful. The tax masters actually beat them, but I would, um, I don't know if it's possible like the tax masters that, that would beat them, um, but um, you know, the officers of the children of Israel basically went and told Pharaoh, like, you know, how wherefore delight thou thus with thy servants? Like, why are you doing this? You know, um, and I think it's pretty bold to actually like go meet someone that you know that is an absolute devil to um and confront him because this is a confrontation and so it's like well this is the situation there is no straw um and you're telling us to make bricks and behold thy servants are beaten but the fault is in thine own people right and they said you know ye are idle ye are idle thus ye say and let us go and do sacrifice to the lord you know it says and, and i don't think that you know um this officers of the children of israel actually know that it was pharaoh that actually you know um, basically ordained, well, to use a less, you know, professional word here, word here, um, that basically told them to use no, um, to give them no straw. It's like, it's the fault of the people that they're not giving us any straw and like, we're not being productive as we used to be. Um, it's not our fault. Right. And it's like, well, if you then tells him like, it's, well, you're being idle. Look, you're the one that's been idle. Like, let like let, you're saying that we should i should let you go for three days have a three days off and you go and sacrifice to your lord because of you don't want your your god to punish you like you're just wanting a break because you're just freaking lazy and it's like go there for now go and walk for there shall no straw be given unto you yet ye shall deliver you know the tower of bricks as like you said go and walk you're gonna like yes under that same condition and guess what you're gonna do you're gonna produce the same amount of efficiency as you were when you had the straw, right? And obviously, it says the officers of the children of Israel did see that they were in evil case after it was said, ye shall not minish aught from the bricks of your daily tax. So they knew that this wasn't about their productivity. This wasn't about anything. Like This was like, it's like a setup. Like they, they knew that they were, they were caught up in a setup, right? And they were going to suffer. They were going to be oppressed. Like there was nothing that they would do will satisfy the the satisfied Pharaoh, okay? Like even if they were to meet the quota, they would be told that they did not meet the quota. So they were set up, you know, because of what, because of what, um, Pharaoh and Aaron had 
come to approach him, demanding that the children of Israel be let go, even for just a few days. But the Lord had told Moses, right, that the, the art of the king of Egypt will be hardened. Um, so this is just like, you know, a glimpse of like, just to show you the weight of the oppression that was on the backs of those people, right? And then we're going to do um, Ezra chapter um, 2, verse 64 to um, 64 to 67. It says, so now we know what basically is going on, how the children of Israel were basically like from the time of Babylon, you know, out the way of what they were they were broken down, okay? They were crushed, you know, just like the way it described in the book of the Re Revelation, how like um, the vine um, of the vine of the white press was actually crushed and there was blood coming out of it, okay? Like people were actually crushed, okay? Um, and then you kind of see even previously, we see how, you know, they were actually treated by Pharaoh and how they were just basically like just given to labor uh, in slavery and yeah it was really hard it was hard times you know and now we see in the book of Ezra chapter 2 verse 64 to 67 it says the whole congregation together was 42,303 score beside their servants and their maid of whom there were 7,330 and seven and they were among them 200 singing men and singing women their horses and 700 you know 36 30 and six their most 200 45, their camels, 435. You know, by the time you look at this number, going back into like, you know, if you look at the book of Ezra, the totality of chapter two, it will tell you exactly like, you know, the number of people that will, will tell you like, well, it says not, these are the children of, um, of this are, these are the children of the province that went out, out of captivity of those which had been, had been carried away when Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried away into Babylon and came. They came again. Now, this is what we're talking about in the book of um, Amos chapter 5. They came again into Jerusalem and Judah, even one unto east, everyone unto east city. And there was a calculation of the amount of people that actually came back. If you're doing the calculation, you need to compare it to other scriptures, which is something that I did not basically do it today but then if you really do it you find it in the book of um you find in the book of chronicles you find in the book of chronicles chronicles one and two you know you find the details there it's all there um this one is just basically like the bible talks about this in book of amos about how they would leave by a thousand so they were leaving in they were leaving judah they were leaving jerusalem not because of free will not because they wanted to go and have some vacation and not because of they wanted to leave for better quality of life like me and many of many of us for immigration they were leaving because they were forced out of it they were leaving because they were, they were taken captive uh, many men and many women were actually killed in the process so they were leaving by force and so by the time the Lord had actually played, placed the mandate on the king of Persia to basically build back the city of Judah and Jerusalem, like they were just a few that were coming back. Like in all of the land, like there were just a few that were coming back. And you see the details here. Um, it talks about, it says, which came from Zerubbabel, right? The, the families, you see them, Joshua, Nehemiah, Sariah, even Mordecai. Um, you, by the time you look and do the details and do the linking and everything like that, you would see how, you know, beautiful this family tree is. And we can just kind of like be more productive in your Bible study, which I'm planning to do. But I know that's going to take an extensive amount of time to actually make the, the linkage um but yeah um you can see you know for bani 642 these people were more they were more they were actually a lot um and it talks about the total number of them after um so it says the whole congregation of those people they did gather together all of them in total in verse 64 there were only about 42000 imagine 42000 the whole of Jerus Jerusalem and Judah was just 42000 and 303 score that is not a lot okay that is like not even up to the city of 
um, Montreal. It's like not even a quarter. And it says beside their beside their servants and their maids of whom there are 7,330 right and and seven there were among them 200 singing men and singing women like this is like not even anything and also like you know just to also mention that you know i think it's pretty interesting just how we see the transition of them suffering going through trials and tribulations just because of sin because of their stubbornness their unfaithfulness their evil wickedness right and the lord is using their position to basically deal with them um and then we see just how they've just come out from that threshing period of their lives. Um, and it's period, I talk about period, but it's like kind of like generations of trials and tribulation. And then having the opportunity after being scattered, you know, abroad, having the opportunity to come together as a whole congregation, you know, um, to actually just fellowship. And for me personally, I think, you know, kind of like um, linking that to my own personal life, like, I feel like, you know, sometimes you just kind of feel isolated from like, as compared to if you're in Nigeria, um, you have like people, your mates, you know, you can kind of like converse with them, like, you know, you're in your own country and stuff like that. Um, but even still, um, and just like here doing your nine to five and you at least you get to go to church like that's why fellowship is so important like you get to go to church and you get to you know fellowship with other christians and so i think like it doesn't really matter like where you are in the world um as a christian what, what really matters is that you're actually joining in congregation with other christians and as i was reading the word of the lord today in the book of ezra chapter two it just basically highlighted the importance of fellowship because it, it grounds you um it's just that the the, the gathering of the saints is a symbolism it's a standpoint it's a proclamation it's a a, a symbol a, a symbol of hope that we are one people and you know we're one people we exist we're here you know no matter what's happening like we're here we are very resilient and we're here no matter what's happening to the body of christ with the matters killing of, of christians like we are here and we are gathered together you know so it's it's really like a a punctuation mark you know um and yeah, it's pretty interesting, isn't it? It's very, very interesting. And that's what we get to do every Sunday, coming together. It's like that same, like this, it's like a symbol of restoration, you know, coming together after working nine to five. I don't know what you have to do in your day to day, but coming to church and gathering with other saints, you know, just materializing and manifesting the hope in the promises of the Lord. Like that is, that is very, very important. It's very, very important. I can't really stress how important it is. Um, and so, yeah, we're going to continue in the book of Amos now. So like we see, we've gone through all of these references to basically just highlight to you, like, you know, this is what the Lord is saying. You know, this is really what the Lord is saying in the book of Amos. And it says, for thus said the Lord unto the house of Israel, seek ye me and ye shall leave. Like I've done this before, you know, this is like, you should seek me, seek me and ye shall, what ye shall leave. And it says, but seek not Bethel, nor, nor enter into Gilgal, and pass not to Beersheba. For Gilgal shall surely go into captivity, and Bethel shall come to naught. Right? He's telling them exactly what's going to happen. And he says, Seek the Lord, ye shall leave, lest he break out like fire in the house of Joseph and devour it. Right? If you don't do, if you don't seek me, I'm going to, you know, do something you're not going to like, you know? It says, uh, lest it break out like fire, right, in the house of Joseph and devour it. Bible talks about how it's going to test the works of men with fire, right? And it says, and there, sh there be none to quench it in Bethel. Ye will turn judgment to wormwood and leave off righteousness in the earth, okay? Seek him that maketh the seven stars in Orion and turneth the shadow of death into the morning and maketh the day da dark with night and calleth for the waters of the sea and pours them out onto the face of the earth. The Lord is his name that strengtheneth the spoiled against the strong. It strengthens 
the spoiled against the strong. So the Lord is able to kind of reverse things, right? It's kind of interesting. We've seen many different pictures of when the children of Israel were, you know, very few numbered. And, you know, just like in the time of um, Gideon, right? The way the Lord specifically told Gideon, like, I don't want you to take, you know, so many soldiers, but I just, I'm going to show you the, my wonders, you know? And yeah, the, the it's able to strengthen the spoiled against the strong. So that the spoiled shall come against the fortress. They hate him that rebuketh in the, in the gate and they abhor him that speaketh uprightly. For as much... Therefore, as your treading is upon the poor, ye shall take from him burdens of wheat, uh, of wheat. Ye shall build houses of hewn stone, but ye shall not dwell in them. Like you're gonna take from him burdens of wheat. You're gonna, and that's the thing, you know. Um, those rich people, and I think like it's pretty interesting. Like you can look at the story of the children of Israel from the perspective like oh my god this people are actually suffering they're going through trials and tribulation and I think that that you know the representation of that picture or that image uh can actually kind of blow your your eyes to seeing you know the Lord and how the Lord is actually feeling to actually putting yourself in the perspective of the Lord and not really seeing the wickedness of those people. Because I feel like sometimes we might, we can't be numb. But I've talked about that just yesterday, well, this morning, very early in the morning, about how numb we can actually be um, by the actions of men. Um, I feel like sometimes we're not even normal mundane people are not exposed to the wickedness of men god is god god is magnificent god is alpha and omega is able to see the things that are done in secret and so there is nothing that is hidden from the lord and i feel like a lot of people think that they're doing evil but you is one thing that you don't know is that god sees you the lord actually sees what you're doing and so when the lord is judging the people like you have no right you have no audacity to be like a safe oh my god like isn't the lord too harsh the god god is the most god is the most righteous god is a good god and he knows everything if he can do this okay you can you can be bold to say that wow this judgment that the lord is giving this people is actually very fair i'm fair in the, in the perspective like it's it's minimal OK, that is that is how we ought to look at things, because if we do know what the Lord is, we're able to know that the way of the Lord is just. OK, men are wicked. And so the the, the children of Judah and Israel and, and, uh, and Jerusalem, they're doing evil, like tremendous evil. They don't care about they They, they sacrifice their children to this God. Right. I believe there was one that's Balaam. They sacrifice their, their God, the, the, their children, and they, they tell them to walk on fire. Many treacherous things that they do, okay? Um, just because of their worshiping devils, practicing sorcery, because of power, okay? The Lord sees everything. There's nothing that the Lord doesn't see. And the, the one that is sent to actually rebuke them at the gate of prophets, they hate him. And it says, for as much, therefore, as your treading is upon the poor, right? You can even, even the children of Israel, like those ones that are attacking them, right? They are basically like them. And I think I was reading one part in the book of um, Second Chronicles about how there was this king, um, I forget his name, is it it's Zedekiah? About how he was thrown in the prison by the king of um, Babylon, I believe. Um, was the king of Babylon, but after after some time, um, he ends up taking the king. The another king actually came after that king, and he took the king of um Jerusalem out of the prison, and then was giving him like you know some salary every month, and they basically become they became buddies. If you read that part, um, so the wicked they know the wicked, they know their bodies, they they. They know their alliances. And so they know what they're doing. You know, they actually know what they're doing. And so these people, the children of Israel that we're reading about, they are not, you know, they are not 
they're not innocent, okay? When they're going through their trials and tribulation, um, they're not innocent. You know, we can talk about a lot of things, even when they went back in Egypt, like what they did wrong, um, what they could have done better and things like that. But there's a there's a difference between you, you know, making a mistake um, because of, you know, some reason that can be justifiable in a way, but then, and for you to actually be doing something absolutely terrible because of your own selfish interest, you know. Um, but yeah, they are treading upon the poor and ye take from him burdens of which so you're taking from people that don't have anything. But the truth is that you, you're going to take, but you're not going to enjoy what you're taking. He says, you're going to, you, ye have planted pleasant wine yards, but ye shall not drink wine of them so what's the point of you gathering if you're not going to actually eat from them you know like a man can gather and gather steal from other people oppress other people and try to and take from them but the fact is that you will never enjoy what you've stolen and it says for i know your manifold transgressions and your mighty sins they afflict the just they take a bribe and they turn aside the poor in the gates form from their rights so this is what they're doing and it says therefore the prudent the lord sees everything that that is it's pretty interesting the lord actually sees everything it says therefore the prudent shall keep silence in that time for it is an evil time right this is what the lord is saying here and it's this time that we're talking these things that we're talking about is happening even now it's happening even now and it says seek good and not evil that ye may live and so the lord the god of all shall be with you as ye have spoken he says eat the evil and love the good and establish judgment in the in the gates it may be that the lord god of hosts will be gracious unto the remnants of joseph therefore the lord the lord the god of hosts the lord said thus wailing shall be in all streets and ye they shall say in all the high ways alas alas they shall cover the husband man to mourning and such as are skillful of lamentation to wailing. And in all vineyards shall be wailing for I will pass through thee, said the Lord. Woe unto you that desire the day of the Lord. To whom, to what end is it for you? The day of the Lord is darkness and not light. And so we know the day of the Lord to be a day of judgment. Okay, it's a day of peril. Okay. And it says, why would you desire the day of the Lord? Um, since the day of the Lord is going to be darkness, it's going to be punishment, many will die, many will be afflicted, you know. And it says, as if a man did fly like a lion, um, fly, so, so I said fly, did I say fly? <laughs> as if a man did flee um, from a lion and a bear met him. So you're running from something, but then you get attacked by something else and went into the house and leaned his hand on the wall and a serpent beats him. So there is nowhere to actually run to. There is nowhere to hide. You can try to run in the uh, run to the mountains, but then you encounter something. The mountain turns into like a frigging bear or beast and, and is pursuing you at the same time. So like you, basically the, the world or the earth becomes a trap it becomes like some sort of like you know um horror movie it becomes like a, a a trap basically you know like a, a a space set up to actually just kill you and that is the power of the lord that is what the lord can actually do right and and i think like you know going back to the experiences of the children of israel in the land in, in earth right that is basically what the lord had, had, that basically did like he took off his hands from their matter, right? And they're saying like, you know what? You're gonna, you're gonna do what you wanna do, right? And first of all, the earth is already cursed um, with the death, you know? So whatever, wherever they turned, if they did not have the protection of the Lord or they aren't like, if they did not have the protection of the Lord, they will encounter evil. And oftentimes like the Lord is backing their enemies, okay? That there's a word, you know, just like the way the word of Lord has the, the word of Lord has said concerning the king of Persia that he would actually build the build up Jerusalem. There was a word, the Lord spoke a word to back up the actions of the king of Persia. And so, like, even though the earth was cursed, there were certain things that would work in his favor because of the word of the Lord upon his life. And so, and I think it's pretty symbolic for, for us in our own present time to know that whatever the Lord has said, what I to promise that the Lord has said to you uh, concerning your life, that you can always stick to that word, you know, 
and no matter what's happening, no matter the symbolism of death you see or curses, you know, which is not for you, but around you, right? Always stick to the word of the Lord because it is a light onto your path. Um, and it says, you know, hey, you know, shall not the day of the Lord be darkness and not light, even very, even very dark and no brightness in it. I hate, I despise your feast days and I will not smell in your solemn assemblies. Though ye, burn, though ye offer burnt offerings and your meat offerings, I will not accept them. Neither will I regard the peace offering of your fat base. So you can see like there's a, um, there's a, you know, there's a, the relationship that they have with the Lord is shattered. Um, it's kind of like it's too late now, just like the way the angel of the Lord um, had thrown the, um, the golden scepter was it yeah the golden the golden i think it's a scepter um with the incense throwing it to down the earth like kind of saying like it's already it's already too late right now to be hearing any prayers it's already time for the judgment you know um so basically like yeah like it's already too late now like you can try to offer me all of those things and it's like take thou away from me the noise like come noise now noise of your songs but i will not hear the melodies of thy voice but let's judgment run down as waters like you know i remember the dream that i had about i talked i talked about it about the lord actually coming to judge the world and there was like pandemonium in the room and see like the the judges actually was coming you know and it just kind of felt like you know, it's was a bit like, oh my God, you know, like he thought it's a pretty serious thing. Okay. It's pretty serious. Um, the Lord is coming and it says, let the judgment run down as waters and righteousness as a mighty stream. And have ye offered unto me sacrifices and offerings in the wilderness 40 years, o, o house of Israel. Um, and I think like it's pretty interesting because like what's really happening and um how they've actually managed to kind of kick the Lord out of their premises. Um, and yeah, like it's kind of like, basically, I don't even, I wouldn't say they actually kicked the Lord out of their presence. They basically removed themselves from the, from the altar, because like you find that, you know, the symbolism of the altar was removed, such as like the temple of the Lord, um, the priest would became corrupt, there was corruption in the land. And so you kind of see how there is a removal, a, a, a there was a removal, that's the word basically. There was a removal. And so it's like by the time you look at the land now, you can only see just like the, the word of the Lord described, you know, um the that's like, that's like the way the word of the Lord described the 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 Sodom, the land of Sodom and um um not Sodom and Gomorrah, but anyways, kind of like the land, the the, the place where Jesus Christ actually was crucified, Golgotha, right? Um it was a, it was the symbolism is kind of like death, you know. And so it had become this place of of death, you know, it become a place of death, and so life cannot live in there like God cannot stay in there so even though they were crying to the Lord even though they, they were burning all of these offerings and things like that it's like trying to it's like hearing um, noises from hell you know um I think it's, it says um uh it, the land was from Gomorrah in hell uh, it's a reference from Re Revelation I actually forgot forgot the verse but just ringing in my head um anyways yeah, like it's like kind of like just remember the story of the rich man and, and um Lazarus, I think. Was it I might be anyways, and it was crying on to um Father Abraham to give him like even it's just like a drop of water, right? And it's like, no, I can't give you it's too late now, you know, like it's too late. And that's what we're that's what I'm basically saying here. Like, you know, sometimes you're 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 the Lord has given you many, many chances. It's like it's just like sometimes it's just too late, like you basically done your words and it's just like it's just too late you know it's too late and we don't ever want to get there and we're in this with, if we have breath inside of us we can actually make things right with the lord um and the question is now like what do you have around you what do you see around you um, and i think like your environment your surroundings are really important like what do you see around you are the symbolism of the things that are around you signify the presence of the lord you know um your very present 
surrounded and will tell if you're actually part of the altar of the Lord. And so you can see the things that are happening just around the children of Israel. And, and if you're reading even in the book of Second Chronicles, First Chronicles, First Kings and Second Kings, you see there was even one time they actually described their um, you know how the children of Israel would be living in camps? About in their camps, there was there was farming, and the people were actually the animals were dying off. The children were were actually people were actually getting they were dying. They actually dying like they were the place was smelling. Um, and so this is just a symbolism of like hell, you know, like the the, the spiritual symbolism, like where they were at, you know. And I want I want to go into the the text. Um, it's in Revelation, like it talks about the spiritual. Um, it's a really it's a it's reference regarding like the um, the symbolism of spiritual location, um, the physical manifestation of you know of the earth realm translated into the in the spiritual. Um, realm as well so it's kind of like saying that um this location that i am right now there's a similar location of it in hell um but it's translated in something else and that's what we're talking about you know the living component versus the non-living components about how i myself when i the translation of me in the in the spiritual realm can be a non-living component so yeah, it's just that um parallel, the par parallel of like two realities. And so um however your environment is will tell you know how you know your spiritual reality really is like. Um so you just need to take a look at your life and turn and see like what is really happening, how is my spiritual you know state like how is my spiritual health like what is really happening? And oftentimes when you see the same things happening in your life, it calls for repentance, it calls to say the Lord is calling like come unto me, come unto me, seek me, you know, and you, you know, let me go back into the word again. It says, Seek me, seek me, and what and ye shall leave. Right now you're living in death, right now you are dying, right now there's death happening around you and it's going to continue like that you know unless you seek me and it says the day of the lord is coming and when that day comes you're going to be judged when that day comes it's going to be darkness when that day comes it's going to be peril you know and you might be saying that oh i just want they let this all you know they know the way the unbelievers actually speak they, those that don't believe in god they say like they want the system to actually just you know kind of start all over again but guess what if the system if the system of the lord you know crumbles down it means that it is the the, the time has come the time has come but the the new conversion the new reality the new system you in quotes you call it the new jerusalem and the new earth that's going to be arising is only for the righteous only for the saints only for those that have been purged burnt in fire only those that have come out of the fire you know shinier brighter you know more holy you know just refined you know and it says though yea offer me all of these things you do all of those things i do not want them why because they're coming from hell you know god doesn't pay attention to what's happening in hell you know the demons the devils they're the ones that would take charge of all of these things there they'll take care of what's happening in hell you know and what jesus christ came to do in the earth you know he came to basically take the keys from you know death and hell right um, and that's what he did. But you guess what? It's already, it's already he ha sorry, he has already overcome already. And so if you're willingly going to take your two legs to walk yourself into, into hell and to partner with death, that is your own choice. OK, and so you're going to have to suffer the burden. OK, the Lord will call out to you. The Lord will use his disciples. The Lord will use his servants to preach the word of the Lord to you. But if you still decide that you want to still be in that demonic partnership with death and you still want to be living in your hell, then that is your own choice. You will have to suffer the consequences. You will have to pass through that. And you see that we see many times in the, in the scripture about how the children of Israel were going through the worst moments of their lives. But they are stubborn. They have a heart of, of stone and they don't want to repent. And this is the story of a lot of unbelievers today, right? Because of the enemy has built up strongholds in their hearts, in their minds, you know? It says, take thou away from me all of those things. It says, but 
let the judgment run down as waters. He said, have you offered unto me sacrifices or, or, or offerings in the wilderness 40 years or house of Israel when I, when I took you out of, the, out, of the, 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 out of Egypt and I split the, the, the sea, the Red Sea into two and I made you walk through it. Nothing happened to you. The children of Israel, the, the armies, they came chasing after you because they wanted they wanted to continue to oppress you but i i dealt with them you know i i let the waters close up upon them and after i let you reach the other side i had compassion on you i i protected you i provided for you i provided manner unto you i i overcome i through me you overcome you overcame your enemies you know I love these things I did for you. But what did you do? Did you ever offer me a sacrifice? You know, many, many, many people out there, they're unbelievers, right? They they don't think about how the rain is pouring down on their heads. They don't think about, you know, how they actually get in shelter. Um, they don't think about all of these things. The head that they're breathing, you know, who created their them, their skin, you know, the air on their heads, you know what who is taking care of them you know there are a lot of people that are breathing by they're they breathing but they have to bite the head that they breathe you know people that are living off of medication many different things happening to many people one walking on the sidewalk not on the main road and then the car comes to hit the person and the person dies but you are alive there, there's many videos you see people are even in their in their homes they're in their homes and an accident happened in their homes you know many houses burned down but not your own the lord has managed to make you survive this perils this evil of this world but what have you ever done for the lord what have you ever done to show that you are grateful to him so we will see we see that the children of israel they're unfaithful people they're actually very ungrateful and we can see that you know even out of the abundance of the of the goodness of the Lord in their lives, right? You you'd see that they didn't really they didn't think about the longevity of their relationship with the Lord. It's the responsibility knowing that the relationship with the Lord does not end with you. Like you are a continuation of your lineage, um, and so. Just like the way the Lord attached a, a, he said he attached nations to Abraham. So Abraham was not fulfilling his obedience for himself alone. Abraham knew the burden that was on his back. He was fulfilling his obedience for the nations that was attached to him. And so, and this is the responsibility. And this is basically the, the expectation that the Lord has for each and every one of us that, you know, you're doing what the Lord has asked you to do, not because of, you know, oh, I'm doing it for myself or because I personally want to go to heaven, but it's about, you know, your next generation. It's about the little ones that are watching you they're looking at you they're looking at your ways we see in the book of first and second kings about how the kings you know did evil and their children also did evil in the sight of the lord even for those ones that did good the question is did they teach their children to do good you know and to serve the lord did they do that and so this is the question that we need to ask ourselves. Are we good stewards? Good stewardship is not just about you managing the resources the Lord has granted upon you, but it is also about how do you teach the people? How do you teach the children about the Lord our God? How do you, what do you, how do you, how do you teach and cultivate the relationship with the Lord? How do you help them cultivate that relationship? That is absolutely important because, and you have to teach them to also teach their children, you know, about the Lord. And it says, but ye have born the tabernacle of your molosh and shun, your images, right? The star of your God, which ye made to yourselves. Therefore, will I cause you to go into captivity beyond Damascus, said the Lord, whose name is the God of hosts. And so this rubbish, this idolatrous activities, tradition, culture, it is still happening in today's world. In fact, it is very, very common. The devil knows, it, and the devil is actually bold about this. The children of, the, of darkness are actually bold with their demonic practices, right? Um, And the Lord is 
God Almighty is God of the heavens and the earth, okay? Um, this leads to gods will lead you nowhere. These ones are the gods, they're idols of this earth. They are idols of this earth and they don't, they don't belong in the court of the Lord. You need to understand, you know, if you understand your ranking as a human being, and if you have an attachment with, with the Lord, if you have a relationship with the Lord, you will understand that if you keep that relationship and nurture that relationship, where you belong is in the heavenlies. The Bible talks about how the world will end and then we'll have a new reality. This world of struggles will not be our eternity and that we are going to be led into a better reality. And that is going to be in the presence of the Most High God. All who have ever desired as a human being, whether you, you believe in the Lord or you don't believe in the Lord, all your soul, all your being, all your heart, all that you are, what you need, what the void that you're feeling, everything that you are, what you need is the Lord. It's not the man, it's not the money, it's not the woman, it's not the um the, the gold, it's not the winnings, it's not whatever you think that you need. What you need is God. That is all you ever need. God created you for that relationship with him. That's the reason why he created you. It's the void that needs to be filled in your heart. And he has created, he, he, made, the, he, had made, he has made a process whereby you can be purged enough. This reality that you're living in is a reality where you can be purged so that you can enjoy that communion that you 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 need that communion with the Lord that your soul craves, and so it is for your own benefit that you go through the threshing moments. And don't don't despise the moments of pain. Don't despise the moments where the Lord has kept you in waiting. It says, hold on for just a little while. Hold on, just a little while, and it's going to happen. Hold on and press in. Okay, hold on and press in. What you really 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 want. Trust me. If you don't trust him, but trust the word of the Lord, he's the Lord. Try him, test him, and you're going to see. Test the Lord, test him. Just try and believe in him. Just try, try, just try and believe in him. Test the Lord and you're going to see. Test the Lord, just seek him. Open the Bible, seek him, test him, and you're going to see because the Lord is good. The Lord strong and mighty, compassionate and kind, righteous, and so beautiful beautiful in his ways and his manners and his dealing with us is a good God. And so with that being said, you know, I just want to let you know that, you know, you don't want to be caught in a cap. You don't want to be a captive of the enemy. You know, you don't want to be a captive of the enemy. The Lord who, you have so many oppositions around you, right? So many oppositions around you, many, many, you see, <laughs> it reminds me of the book of, um, um uh, well, Second Kings of the King Ezekiah, right? Ezekiah, um, when the I think like he was sick and then he got healed, and then the um king of Babylon actually came to see him, and then he went on to showing the king of Babylon all of his gold, the golden temple of the Lord. He showed the, the king of Babylon that his treasuries and things like that. Uh, and that's pretty interesting because like, you know, as a child of the Lord, even as a, as a creature of the Lord, the Lord has given you treasures. You see, the devil knows that the Lord has given you treasures. The Lord continues to give all of his creations treasures, whether you believe in him or not. The Lord that pours rain upon our heads gives us treasures it gives us the things that we need to survive that's how god is god is a good god he cannot help it but to be good and so the lord provides for us provisions whether you believe in, in him or not he provides for you provisions and so the devil knows this the devil will connive and deceive you to take whatever the lord had given you he would take it from you because of ignorance ignorance you can call it stupidity but yeah and so the king of babylon did not start off by by attacking you know the um king edekiah or edekiah uh he didn't just come attacking him straight up if, if he tried to befriend him first you know they had some sort of relationship he even brought it brought gifts onto him like you know and that, that the king Ezekiah was like showing him like what he had and at the end of the day, the Lord prophesied to him through the, the prophet and told him, like, you know, the, you went to show him all the things that you have in your treasuries. But guess what's going to happen? He's going to come and he's going to fight you for that. And he's going to take everything that you have because that's what the devil does. That's what your enemy does. 
The devil will come to steal, kill, and destroy. Whether you, 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 it's like you need to, you need the Lord for wisdom. And if you don't have the Lord for wisdom, you go about squandering all that he has given you like a prodigal son. So we're going to pray. Um, may we never be in the captivity of the enemy in Jesus' name. Abba, Father, I thank you, Lord, for your word today. O oh, Lord, be thou exalted, O oh, Lord, in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father, for giving, for teaching us to seek you and in whatever we're doing, to always seek you, Lord, and to place you on and make you number one in our lives, O oh, Lord. No matter what's going on, we place you as number one in our lives in Jesus' name. And I pray that uh, we just want to say thank you for all of the trials and tribulation that we've gone through. Thank you, Father, for softening our hearts, oh Lord, to invite you in and to continually commune with you and to be in your presence in Jesus' name. But I we pray and we just we pray that our lives will be sermons for the people that yeah, you to teach and preach the word of the lord we will not just hear the word of the lord and just go about our days we'll be hearers of the word and also doers of the word in jesus name i worship you god may name be highly exalted lord in jesus name and i pray that as we come to the next bible study on saturday that you will preserve continue to preserve our souls and you continue to guide us in jesus name i glorify your name O lord in jesus name thank you father for the unbelievers out there i pray father that you will give them the grace to believe for those ones that will believe i pray that they will get the opportunity to hear the word of the lord and i pray that you will continue the, the holy spirit to continue to influence their lives to their minds their hearts their lives to actually receive the word in jesus mighty name amen okay so guys thank you so much for watching i am super tired <laughs> But I'm going to see you in the next one. That's going to be on Saturday. Remember that you should do something that will actually, you know, propagate the gospel of the Lord because the Lord is coming. Jesus Christ is coming. And um, you should be excited. Are you excited? Yeah. The time of enjoyment is finally approaching. The time of enjoyment as is finally approaching and what we've ever wanted is finally coming it's finally closing in the timeline is closing in you should be excited guys thank you so much i'll see you in the next one guys bye